Thank you, Rajesh, for the kind introduction. And I think it's a very pertinent to use the uh, these newer insulins. We have already been discussing for last so many years because they are available in Indian market for at least more than a decade now. But I think the two things which have happened in last, say, uh, say five, six years, once the availability of the SGL2 in having a three, four, even the five OHAs. So prescribing four OHAs or five OHAs altogether and is unnecessarily prolonging the, delaying the use of insulin. That is happening once. Secondly, yes, physicians' inertia, patients appeasing, all were the factors. But I think the another phenomenon which we are a finding uh, day by day is even the patient starts on insulin, but they are not titrating it. So there is a very slow titration or they don't titrate, they continue to remain with the same dose. So the purpose of giving insulin is defeated. So I think with these difficulties, I think we are again going to discuss and some new data have come about the Diglutec in pregnancy that I will also discuss with you. But we will talk more about that. How can we, these insulins are really useful to achieve the targets one with minimal weight gain and with minimal overall hypoglycemia and nocturnal hypoglycemia. So my, uh, I think this I can leave it. Okay, this is back. Okay. So financial disclosure, I already been disclosed here. Yes. So we have a case study. So here is a patient who is a 45 year old person by profession. He is an engineer. So having a usually a sedentary life, duration of diabetes is around six years. Hemoglobin A1C, so average hemoglobin A1C as a, at a presenting or at a first presentation, even it is around 8 to 9 percent in the country. And the, I think the, even in our ICMR in diab data, we also showed that the average hemoglobin A1C was present, at presentation was 9.9 percent. .9%. So his BMI is 27. So this was another belief in the patient, minds of people that we are centrally obese, but our BMI is less than 25. So even by this criteria, even you follow the European criteria, still we are, many people are overweight and obese. So we are now both, in fact. We are, we have got a dual adiposity, we have got a both central as well as the overall BMI is also high. So fasting and PP both are uncontrolled. And uh, you can see that blood pressure is also not near the targets. The lipids are also bad. And the EGFR is also low, 55 ml, so it's a below 60, already having a stage 3. And urinary albumin excretion, so you only qualifies for A2. Family history of diabetes is present, yes, takes alcohol 2 drinks per week. And non-smoker and a very irregular exercise. And he has got a medical history of hypertension for 7 years and dyslipidemia. So having said all this, the, his treatment history, he is on antihypertensive therapy, statins and cardiac drugs. However, his blood sugar remains uncontrolled. So currently, he is on metformin, liraglutide and ampagliflozin. And the still, the glucose levels are uncontrolled. Weight is also, uh, he is overweight and uh, he has got a dyslipidemia. So uncontrolled hyperglycemia is one of the major issues. Weight is another issue, as we heard recently that there's so many cardiovascular risk factors. He has got an accumulation of that. And he has got a very hectic schedule. And he usually travels often and unsure about taking the insulin on fixed time daily. So there are certain challenges depending upon the lifestyle of a given person. So what the ADA 2023 recommends, the ideal choice of insulin at initiation. If you prefer injectable therapy to reduce hemoglobin A1C, then I think you first goes towards the GLP-1 receptor agonistic analogs. And yes, the cost here is an issue. And so the if still A1C is above the target, you add basal insulin. But I think in most of our clinical practice, we are more going towards the basal insulin to begin with if there's a really need of injectable therapy. You can argue oral semaglutide is also available, but it is also very expensive. But yes, if you go by the guideline, then the weight target is very important then the weight target is very important and then weight target is very important so the choice is basically GLP-1 receptor agonistic analog but the basal insulin still remains the mainstay. 
So the features of an ideal basal insulin includes so it's a flat, peakless activity. So to minimize the risk of hypoglycemic events, the problem with any insulin is that there is a marked intra-individual variability in absorption of insulin. This is the problem with the insulin molecule. So even you inject the same dose of insulin in a given person every day, and even with the same quantum of a meal, the variability in absorption is too much. And the insulin which was shown to be having a least variability in absorption was Detiber. So Levimer is the one insulin which has got a least variability in absorption of insulin. So however, we'll discuss about the variability in absorption with Glargin U300 as well as the Degludet. So but we need a flat peakless insulin to minimize the risk of hypoglycemia. <coughs> Sorry. And it should have a long duration of action, so 24 hours. So I think the first basal insulin was basically NPH, which was... Uh, which was uh, invented in some, somewhere in 1950s. But later on, we have got a long-acting and then ultra-long-acting. So ultra-long-acting usually means that it is acting for more than 24 hours. And why this additional advantage of whenever you have a long-acting insulin or ultra-long-acting insulin, you have a, some advantage of dosing flexibility. So usually we say the fixed time for a, like glycine we say half an hour or one hour is a usual flexibility, but you have a more flexibility with the Degludec as a, and you got a more flexibility of uh, U300. So the variability in absorption of insulin, that's a problem with the molecule in fact. And that also, that's a problem with the individual as well. I think you have a minimum variability when you give a minimum dose. Like in a pump, you use only a one unit per hour. So the variability in absorption, even with the same insulin, is very low. So the concept is that, the how can you minimize this variability? And one of the way to minimize the variability is making the insulin peakless and longer duration of action. So the first generation basal insulin, so this is, I think, the journey of insulin, which you can see that. So the, I, I think there's no need to tell about that. The first generation analogs, here you see the glycine and detimer, then you have the glycine U300, then you have the Degludec ultra long acting basal insulin. So this is about the glargin. I think the, this is the only available insulin which has got acidic pH. All available insulins currently in a current scenario is all are neutral insulins. Only the glargin is acidic. The pH is 4. And the advantage of this pH 4 is that because the pH of the subcute tissue is 7. So whenever the glargin is injected into the subcute tissues, this makes a micro-precipitate in the alkaline milieu of the subcute tissues. And from these micro-precipitates, the insulin is released slowly. So that's the mechanism that how the drug is acting in a longer duration of action. So it is making a micro-precipitate in the alkaline milieu of the subcute, uh, subcutaneous tissue pH. So that's how the drug acts for a long time. And you can see that the glargin versus NPH so glargin here again is assuming, is a, you can see in the red, the glargin is assuming as is a almost, um, uh, almost steady state level, while you NPH, you have the peaks and troughs. So the consistently proven hypoglycemia, I think that one of the major fear with any insulin is hypoglycemia. <coughs> and the another fear is weight gain. And the hypoglycemia worsens when you reach near the target. Suppose you are at a, you start with a hemoglobin A1C of 10, they hardly there is a risk of hypoglycemia. But when you reach near 7, so then the probability of hypoglycemia also increases. So the, when you reach near the target, the patient is really scared of hypoglycemia. And certainly when you have a, a anabolic effects, because insulin is the most potent anabolic hormone, so you gain weight as well. So here all the studies. So Degludec versus Glargin U100, you had a begin, switch to, devote and all. They all show that nocturnal, overall or severe hypoglycemia. Now you classify by level 1, 2, 3. So here all are reduced. That's I think one of the major reasons for that. So nocturnal goes down. That's I think most worrisome. Even in a daytime hypoglycemia, patients take, so take care by either munching or snacking in between. But in the night when there's an auction, and particularly those who have a hypoglycemic awareness, this may be very, very troublesome. So the nocturnal hypoglycemia also drastically goes down. I think that's one of the beauty of this. And so this was more certainly with the Degludec versus Glargin. Then, I, as I mentioned that as you reach near the target, the probability of the hypoglycemia increases. 
and here you see with the glargin versus diglutac glargin u100 versus diglutac so here the risk of hypoglycemia is much higher when you are reaching near the target with glargin as opposed so here the risk is something around 150 events or patients per year 150 patients per 100 per year as opposed to 100 with diglutac so the risk of hypoglycemia when you are achieving near the target is also lesser so it is again because of it's again a more steady levels you achieve and maintain for a longer time and the variability in absorption is also less then if you the onset of action usually starts with a one and a half hour with the diglutac duration of action is 42 hours but usually initially the diglutac was planned to give a weekly then uh, twice then thrice a week so eventually it has come to 24 hours so i think the best the total profile or steady state is usually maintained about 24 to 28 hours and the glargin u100 two to four hours and the duration of action lasts for 18 to 24 hours and even you maybe also must have experienced in practice that many patients with the glargin almost 20 25 percent of patients with glargin they do require the twice daily doses of glargin and the reason for that because in some patients the kinetics are like that so they do have a duration of action something around 18 hours so you identify by these individuals when the fasting is controlled but the pre-dinner is not controlled that's why you choose to give the insulin glargin twice a day if you go further the flexibility the flexibility however the diglutac even the data they claim 8 to 48 hours but the Truly is you have got around eight hours duration of flexibility with that. However, you don't enjoy this much of flexibility even with glargin U100. Yes, certainly you have it with the U300 around three to four hours flexibility you have. So this flexibility is again with the steady state continues to remain for 24 to 28 hours. Then the problem with the variability. So whenever the insulin absorption is variable, the glycemic excursions are also variable so you have got a limited or the within day variability is also much low so here you see with the diglutac represented as a blue and the and the gray and you can see that the day to day variability is also higher with glargin u100 as opposed to diglutac and if you say day to day variability <coughs> so here the cv you see that CV is 20% for diglutac, while 82% is with glargin. So certainly you have a very higher CV for glargin as opposed to diglutac. So what it does mean that the variability in a day-to-day -day time means a steady state remains steady for a pretty long time with diglutac as opposed to glargin. Then the target in range and the target below range with diglutac and there was a switch pro RCT CGM based evidence and what it also showed significantly better target in range and nocturnal target below range means high, below hypoglycemia with diglutac versus glargin U100. So other ultra long acting so here we'll talk about U300 this you know all the how this molecule but you see that the molecule here the pH is neutral it remains as a you can see that as a dimer and dihexamer because natural insulin even has got a tendency to make hexamer in the beta cell but whenever it is released it is released as a monomer here it remains as a dihexamer and this dihexamer so first the phenol is depleted and because with the depletion of a phenol it makes multi hexamer molecule and these multi once the zinc is depleted further in the sub q tissues then the zinc diffuses slowly so this leads to formation of monomers and these monomers are slowly released and then even in the circulation it binds with the fatty acids which prolongs its further half-life so how does the so glargin and how does the so both the technologies are different to prolong the duration of action to reduce or to minimize the variability the absorption of insulin and here the glargin u300 the finding of a U300 as a ultra long acting insulin was serendipitously found. It was not by the design. It was just as a concentrate of a insulin was used because of many patients were requiring more than 40 units or 50 units of U100. They just thought that we should make a concentrate of a insulin. So they made a U300. Once they found that there was a U300, then they found that the pharmacokinetics were like similar to 
the deglutide. This was just as a serendipitous finding. This was not the invention. This was just as a discovery that they found that. And they utilize this because whenever you make a concentrate of insulin, it changes the pharmacokinetics of the insulin. Then, so this was the glycogen. So you can see that the U100 versus U300, you have a very compact microprecipitate with the U300 from where it is slowly released as opposed to the glycogen 100 where you have a larger Microprecipitate. So again, the confirmed study, the hypoglycemia results, they more favor of deglutide. If you see this forest plot, so that is more going in a favor of a deglutide. So both nocturnal as well as the oral hypoglycemia are less. <coughs> then the duration of action, we have talked about that. It's around 48 hours. Uh, 42 hours and the U300 has got around 32. So both are 24 hours plus peak of action, minimal peak, so the almost steady state. So they are called peakless insulin and the glycogen U300, the onset of action starts around 2 to 6 hours. <coughs> Flexibility. So I mentioned about 8 hours with Diglutec and with the U300, you have around 3 hours of flexibility. Then the day within a day variability, you can again see that the deglutic almost flat, while the variability in glucose profile here is marked with U300. Then the overall day to day variability, if you see this, yeah, so you can see that so much of variability with the glycogen that is, you see the insulin levels. So, one it peaks it sometimes in a day and then goes down, while the with the deglutic. Hardly there is any variability. So it's a more steady state you achieve with this. Then potency, I think that's a one way because whenever I think we were discussing this question, whenever you change from a U300 to the Diglutec, should we really change the doses or not? So I think the answer is that when you when the patient is well controlled, the best is don't the patient is not controlled, then you can put on the same dose. But if they are well controlled, I think whenever you change to, even if you change to Diglutec, so by this version, I think you may require a, some 10% or 15% reduction in doses of Diglutec. So the potency is based on the area under curve for the glucose infusion rate. And so the glucose infusion rate, if you see that with the Diglutec, the AUC is 1900 versus 1300. So the, here you see the difference of 0.698. So the it's a 30% more potent than uh, Diglutec is more potent than U300. Then the bright study, so you can have a better fasting glucose and even the doses are less. If the potency is more, then the doses are also less. And so you say vice versa, the glycogen U300 requires 20% extra doses. So this is in our confirmed study. Adherence, yes, certainly if you were to lesser hypoglycemia and if you got a lesser doses the acceptance and adherence is definitely much better so you can use in a wide range of population hepatic renal elderly population even patients with their own dialysis people have tried even on an alternate day the uh, basal insulin therapy as well <clears throat> Yes, this was the one question which was raised when the glargin came for the first time that glargin and cancer. And this was basically based on the fact that the glargin has got an effect on IGF-1 receptor. Later on, the origin trial by the glargin only, they refuted this and they told there are two types of metabolic variants, M1 and M2, which was responsible for a clearance of that. So there was a no issue. I think that issue was finally ended. But certainly, if you talk about in physiology, the diglutec and IGF-1, the glycogen has got a more affinity for the IGF-1 receptor as opposed to diglutec, but the clinical significance remains unclear. So device, I think, yes, you can deliver 80 units at one time versus 60 units in a flexipan. But certainly, I think whenever you use more than 30 or 35 units at one shot, again, it also changes the pharmacokinetics. That's why the one of the dictum was that whenever you use an insulin 30 or 35 units at a one time, the best is or requirement is more than that, you split into two. <clears throat> so the ideal insulin, the insulin deglutec fits the bill. So it's a flat peakless. 
it's a minimum variability and it's a long duration of action. So la latest update is use in pregnancy and I think the why? Because why we talk about the use of insulin in pregnancy as a why we should have a discussion even on this. Insulin does not cross the placenta. Insulin is the most safe medications during pregnancy for both maternal as well as a fetal outcome. But these are the analogs. There was always a fear that they may do have a, some cross to the placenta and may be responsible for uh, some issues. So that's why we have got a data. NPH, we have got a very safe data. Glulisate, so first was Levimer, in fact, which was also very safe. Then your short-acting uh, analogs, Lispro, they also got cleared. So the only problem remained with Glargin. Yes, off the table, uh, off the counter, many people were used. So most of the RCTs, there was no RCTs, but there are many cohort studies and many case reports were available with the use of Glargin. So they had the study of on Diglutec and what. So in a patient who plans to become pregnant, so it was just to see the effect of insulin on embryogenesis. So the women who are planning for pregnancy and women who are pregnant, and finally they showed that the insulin studied, in, so I think finally they clear, very clearly showed that you can use Diglutide without any detrimental effects on maternal outcome as well as a fetal outcome. So insulin, so I finish it here.